Professor Asimoglu, you gave us a lecture tonight on the political economy of state building. I find it interesting that economists today seem to be taking the role of the state more uh, serious than they did before. Before, there seemed to be a discussion that the state is just like, you know, something you had to fight against. Well, I mean, I think the state is everywhere and uh, uh, we have always seen the two faces of the state in social life, in economic life. The state, when it's uh, in the hands of people with nefarious purposes, as it's always as it's often been, uh, it can do great damage. But uh, we also depend on the state for many of the things we take for granted, education, infrastructure, health. But most importantly, law and order and uh, the conflict resolution in society. And we see, for example, today in the Middle East or North Africa, what happens when the state is not there and uh, these disputes have no other way of being resolved than civil war, which, you know, the consequences of which are reverberating all over the world right now. You were, you have written a book called um, Why Nations Fail. Is Syria a failed state now? Oh, absolutely. No, no, no doubt about that. But I think it was a failed state in the making even before the current crisis. You know, uh, Libya, Syria, these societies or Iraq under the iron grip of a dictator that does not invest in society, that does not invest in the ways of resolving conflicts, investing in the human capital health of its society, and dealing with all of the ethnic or other social cleavages that exist in society, they have no way of surviving once that iron grip is re uh, removed, and, and it will be removed one way or another. So it's not a question of living under you know Saddam Hussein or uh, uh, Colonel Gaddafi for, forever. When that moment comes, all hell breaks loose and, and we are just seeing the simultaneous occurrence of many of these dictators falling in the Middle East. But uh, Gaddafi and uh, Saddam Hussein were brought down by foreign intervention, not by some sort of overthrow from the state from, in, from within. Absolutely. So that's why they were all simultaneous, that uh, there was a wave of interventions in the Middle East, starting with the Iraq war and you know, culminating uh, with the soft interventions in par some parts of the Middle East on the hard intervention in Libya during and, and the aftermath of the uh, Arab Spring. But uh, and, and I think the, uh, that, that process certainly did contribute to instability. But at least my view and, 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 and what a lot of evidence suggests is that it's not that these societies could have existed and developed in any uh, way that we can recognize if it wasn't for these Western interventions. So this is not to justify these Western interventions. I think they brought uh, untold suffering at the end because of the way in which they were done and uh, that they were not planned properly. They were uh, coming out of a mistaken reading of what was going on in these societies. But at some level, that was going to happen one way or another. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Greece in the past five years, at least in Germany and in Europe, maybe also in the United States where you are, where you are living, but is Greece a failed state now? Well, the Greeks have been talking a lot about Germans also, but uh, yes, I think it is uh, a lot of, uh, it is, has a lot of problems and some of the problems are uh, related to lack of state capacity, but I don't think it's a failed state in the sense that uh, it is unable to keep order totally. It's not something we can compare to Syria. But I think it is a state that requires a lot of building. And again, the road to that comes through politics. I think part of the reason why in Greece the state has been so weak, and that's also related to the thesis of the lecture I gave, is that Greece has had a totally corrupt, ineffective political system where politicians have been much more interested in you know, stuffing the public service with their supporters or lining their pockets or you know, going after sort of populist policies than investing in the 
uh, institutions of the society that are going to be able to maintain it as a modern economy. And I think that has to change. And uh, perhaps finally there is a recognition in Greece that that has to change. But it's been a very slow process because I think part of it is that the Greek people have been sort of uh, fed a lot of untruths about what was feasible, what the lives that they were living were, they were being taken away just by a financial crisis. I think my sort of read of that is that just like uh, you know uh, Gaddafi's full uh, sort of bringing forth problems that existed in Libya, the financial crisis brought forth problems in Greece that were going to erupt one way or another. But because they erupt in the case of Libya because of uh, Western bombing, in the case of Greece uh, because of the financial crisis, it's always easy to blame somebody else and thinking that you can actually go back to the status quo ante. And I think that's not possible in Greece. It's certainly not possible in Libya. And, and, and it takes a while for people to adjust to that. Would you also say, because on your list, Turkey was sort of listed as a failed state. Is that uh, uh, an old paper or is that a description of today? Oh, no, I don't think uh, I, I meant uh, Turkey as a failed state at all. I think Turkey has a fairly strong central government. What I meant to say in the, in the talk, where well, I didn't get to talk to it, but the reference to Turkey was a state that has, just like the Colombian one that I talked to, has a very strong core, but it's actually very low capacity in many of its peripheral areas. So the Turkish state for you know, 70 years of its existence was totally unable to uh, penetrate the southeastern you know, Kurdish parts, which remained tribal, which remained without infrastructure, without education, without uh, any uh, loyalty or really close relationship with the state. Well, the only relationship was a period, episodic, uh, you know, repression. And, uh, and that's just exactly like what, what happened, you know, with Libya and, uh, sorry, Gaddafi and the uh, uh, tribal areas of, of, of Libya, which is most of Libya, that you know, he, let, he had an iron grip on a few places like Tripoli, but the rest is tribes rule it, and then if he needs something, then he sends the army. And that's the, exactly the lack of state capacity I was emphasizing. OK, last question. Um, you also mentioned there are cases where there is stickiness in reforming those countries, Barbados you mentioned, and others. But there is also the funny example of South Africa and the funny example of the Soviet Union in that sense, because they fell apart or they reformed themselves completely. What, what makes the difference? Well, I mean, I think South Africa is very much in point, actually. South Africa is, at some level, a huge success story because <clears throat> It started from a white minority supremacist rule of uh, just very similar to the Barbados example, 80% of society ruled with very few rights, but it managed to do a very successful transition to democracy, and now it has a fairly well-functioning democracy. But it came with lots of other problems. Uh, in the process, it's sort of unleashed an increase in inequality that's pretty major. <coughs> it's a crime problem, which was always uh, present, became much worse. And because the African National Congress became a monopoly, corruption has set in. And many of the programs that require redistribution of resources from the white privileged minority to the sort of to the mass of uh, 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 the uh, uh, black Africans require state capacity, and that state capacity isn't there. So it leads to theft and corruption, and crime explodes, and, and those are the birth pains of modern South Africa. Thank you very much, Professor Asimoglu. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.